Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining the seminar today. Uh, today we have a, a speaker from Japan, uh, Dr. Takashi Moria, um, who's at the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. He is actually a adjunct uh, fellow uh, of Monash University as well. So he's uh, our, one of our extended family. Um, Takashi obtained his PhD in the University of Tokyo um, uh, in 2013, uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and then he uh, did a JSPS Overseas Research Fellowship at the uh, University of Bonn, and then after that he came back to uh, Japan in the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan as an NAOJ Fellow, and now he is an Assistant Professor um, at the same institute. Um, today, he will tell us about uh, the hunt for high grades of supernovae with Subaru and upcoming wide field telescopes. So, please take it away. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Actually, I was planning to go to, to visit Monash this week, but I got COVID two weeks ago, almost two weeks ago, and then I had to cancel my trip. So, I'm, I'm missing visiting you, but uh, yeah, I hope I can visit you in the near future. Anyway, so yeah, I was, this talk was supposed to be uh, on site, but uh, yeah, anyway, I'm, uh, it's a nice opportunity to introduce our recent work, so I'm giving this talk uh, virtually. So, um, so now, we are in the golden age of gravitational wave astronomy, and we have a lot of information about, uh, uh, especially for black hole masses of stellar, uh, uh, stellar mass, black hole uh, mass distribution. So I guess we, you are familiar with this plot, but uh, these uh, blue um, dots shows all the uh, black holes detected by gravitational waves. Uh, so these two black holes are much to be this bigger one. And now we have, um, I don't know exact number, but almost hundred of uh, such uh, black hole margin detection. And we know many uh, stellar mass black hole mass uh, information. Of course, this uh, black hole mass is determined by uh, uh, massive star evolution. So these, they appear as a result of uh, massive star evolution. So black hole mass distribution we get from this uh, gravitational wave observation is an important test for uh, stellar evolution theory. So very, in a simple picture we have, uh, so this is stellar evolution. This is time axis and this is mass. So if the initial mass is above about, let's say, 10 solar mass, then we have a supernova explosion, and then some uh, neutron star will be left. And then uh, if uh, mass is uh, too large, then, then there will be black hole left after a possible supernova explosion. And then uh, if the mass gets even higher, then maybe there's no explosion at all. And then uh, just black hole will be formed. And if the mass gets even higher, as I will explain later, there'll be another kind of super explosion that may happen. So those pictures can be tested in this, uh, you know, uh, this black hole mass uh, distribution we get from gravitational wave observation. So going into more detail, this is the central uh, density of star and central temperature of a star. And uh, as the star evolves, uh, the central density gets higher and central temperature gets higher. So the evolution goes in this way and uh, following uh, this roughly this uh, relation. Of course, if you do numerical simulation, the actual path gets more complicated because of the nuclear reactions and so on. And uh, as the mass gets higher, the mass 
uh, the, the star will go in this way, as also you can see in this relation. And uh, when the stellar mass is uh, low, then, for example, in the case of this five solar mass, uh, you know, star evolves in this way, and then that in the end touches this uh, uh, electron the region where the uh, equation of state is dominated by electron degeneracy. So the star doesn't need to um, uh, continue nuclear reactions to support itself and electron degenerate pressure will support this star and then the star will end up with white dwarfs. And then as the mass gets higher, uh, the star avoids this region. So the star just keep evolving and the nuclear reaction continues. And in the end, after the ion core formation, uh, because ion is most stable element, uh, the star will, the ion will be uh, dissociated to alpha particles and that will trigger the corpora of supernova. And then in the end, a uh, neutron star will be left. And the mass get, as mass uh, gets higher, as I explained in the previous slide, then uh, there will be black hole formation. Then uh, there will be uh, the star, uh, some stars, uh, you know, even if mass, as mass gets more massive, the star starts to enter this uh, pair unstable region where uh, because of the uh, pair creation, the star gets dynamically unstable and uh, uh, which is called pair instability. So basically in this region, the central density is uh, uh, central region is uh, supported by uh, mainly with the radiation pressure, but uh, we, with this pair creation happening, uh, you lose the, the radiation pressure and the star gets dynamically unstable and that triggers the uh, collapse of the stars. And then the star, if the star, uh, then this, you know, as the star collapses, the central region gets extremely hot, and uh, then the carbon and oxygen core uh, starts uh, explosive nuclear burning, and then that nuclear burning can release enough energy to unbind the whole star, and the star can explode. Uh, this kind of star uh, supernova is called pair instability supernova, and there's some uh, region where uh, you expect to have this pair instability super. Um, because this is uh, explosion of entire star, you don't expect to have uh, black hole formation in this uh, when this pair instability supernova happens. So there is uh, some mass range you don't expect to have black holes. And then if the star gets too massive, then this, uh, of course, the star itself starts to collapse uh, because of this pair instability, but uh, not enough energy to unbind the entire star will be released and then released by the nuclear reaction. So then you this star just collapses to black hole. So this, in short, uh, you have some black hole. Of course, first there's neutron star formation, then there's some black hole star, a black hole formation you expect, and then there's some mass range you don't expect to form black holes, and then you start to see some uh, black hole formation as well. And um, this pair instability supernovae, as I explained, this is these are thermonuclear explosion of very massive stars, and um, they are. Uh, uh, they occur when the helium core mass is between ab about 65 solar mass and 130 solar masses. And uh, if there's no mass loss, the corresponding uh, zero age main sequence mass is around 150 to uh, 300. And there's no compact remnant remain because the entire star will be exploding uh, by the nuclear reaction. And because you need to keep this very high uh, core mass, uh, you don't want to, for stars 
to lose mass uh, to uh, the appearance to be supernova. So if the metallicity is high, then you expect to have a lot of mass loss, which prevents stars to keep this uh, massive core. So uh, these kind of appearance to be supernova are uh, uh, predicted to occur, uh, especially at low metallicity environment. And uh, so this was simple picture. And uh, if there's also a possibility that the uh, star, some star kind of touches through this pair unstable region. So in that case, not the entire uh, star will be ejected as a result of pair instability, but only a part of the star can be ejected through this uh, pair instability. So in this case, if a star kind of close, really close to the unstable region, this star can lose some part of its mass, uh, but then eventually uh, they avoid uh, explosion of the entire star. And uh, in the end, the star will collapse to be a uh, black hole. So those are kind of uh, prediction from stellar evolution theory. And uh, this stellar evolution theory gives you some prediction for black, expected black hole mass distribution. So this is uh, initial helium, helium star mass, and then expected black hole, uh, predicted black hole mass uh, through this uh, helium core mass. As I explained at first, uh, you have basically quark collapse supernova, basically meaning, you know, stars just collapses. And uh, in this massive, uh, massive range, the star will likely just collapse to be a black hole. So just uh, no explosion and just uh, star will collapse. And then as the star gets massive, the star gets close to this pair unstable region. So you expect to have some pair, pulsation of pair instability. So some part of the star will be uh, released through this instability, but eventually the star will collapse. So the star will form black holes. So if there's no pulsation of pair instability, you, this mass will just, uh, you know, you expect to linearly grow, but because of their uh, unstable instability, uh, there's some mass ejection, and uh, then eventually uh, many mass will be, a lot of mass will be released, so the black hole mass will be decreasing. And then there's a region of pair instability supernova where you don't expect any black hole formation. So in this region, there's only uh, no black hole remnants are expected. And then as the mass goes beyond the pair unstable region, then you start to see again the direct crops of stars, uh, which creates massive uh, black holes. So what this stereo evolution predicts is there should be some mass gap uh, in the uh, black holes because of this uh, pair instability, uh, existence of this pair instability and pair instability supernova. And indeed, uh, in, now that we have a lot of uh, black hole uh, mass measurements from the gravitational waves, so you, we can compare this kind of prediction to the uh, observation. And uh, in each case, these two uh, dots show the mass of the two black holes involved in the, uh, these merger events. And uh, it seems there may be some you know, upper mass limit in the black hole mass. But uh, of course, as the, as the mass, as the, uh, the, the number of the black hole merger uh, rates uh, increases, the, the the, we start to see some uh, possible black holes that may fit in this uh, in the mass gap region. So this is one example. So this is again there is an asynchronous mass and the uh, mass of the basically black hole. And then uh, this region we expect to have mass gap, but uh, in this 
particular case, uh, we may have this uh, black hole of one uh, star merged uh, that may have been in this mass gap. Um, so it seems we start to see you know, some inconsistency, but this uh, prediction from the star evolution theory itself is uh, also uncertain. And one major suggested uncertainty is in this carbon alpha gamma reaction rate. And uh, the, the standard rate is in this zero, and this mass range, this mass gap is expected in white, in shown in this white. Uh, this mass range is here. But uh, as this reaction rate is quite uncertain, and uh, if here they put you know, many possible react suggested reaction rate and are fitted with Gaussians. Um, then this is uh, basically minus one sigma uh, rate of the you know, average rate people assume. And uh, if we assume the relatively low reaction rate, and if you go to like minus two sigma, minus three sigma, then this uh, mass gap will shift to relatively upper part, upper mass. So this actual mass gap may be uh, in a higher mass range than uh, the standard, um, what we predict from the standard rate. So this suggested mass gap in the uh, uh, black hole mass distribution, which is uncertain, but uh, one another way to test this uh, prediction of pH stability supernovae is of course we can try to directly observe this uh, pH stability supernovae and see uh, what's the actual property of pH stability supernovae and uh, compare them with the prediction from pH stability supernova. So this pH stability supernova has been uh, modeled by especially by Alex, and uh, it has been prediction for the explosion properties of pH stability supernovae. And uh, this is the explosion energy, predicted explosion energy of pH stability supernovae as a function of helium core mass. And uh, typical supernova explosion has about 10 to the 51 Eg of um, explosion energy. But uh, here, uh, as you can see, uh, this is energy scale with 10 to 51 elk. So even the lowest uh, lowest mass pH stability super ex explosion are predicted have you know, much higher energy than the uh, usual uh, uh, supernovae. And that of course can be a hint to identify pH stability supernova. And also the these pH stability supernovae are predicted have uh, a lot of uh, nickel 56. Uh, nickel 56 is the major luminosity source, heating source of uh, supernovae. So 56 nickel decays to cobalt uh, 56, and then eventually to iron 56. Uh, this uh, nuclear energy is um, can make a supernova very bright. So more uh, production of 56 nickel means brighter supernova. So a typical co crop supernova has uh, about 0.04 solar mass of nickel. And uh, in the lowest mass range of the ISV supernova, the, actually the produced mass of nickel is similar to, uh, or yeah, uh, close to uh, this uh, typical supernova, but as the mass gets higher, then you have, uh, you know, more than 10 solar masses of uh, nickel 56 predicted to be produced. So it's like more than 100 times more, or even 1,000 times more uh, 56 nickel can be produced. That means this pH of supernovae can be extremely bright supernovae, and that can be uh, observationally uh, searched. So Indeed, uh, the, there's a, a prediction by uh, Dan Kaysen about pH stability uh, supernova properties. Uh, this is time after the explosion, and this is the luminosity in optical band. 
And uh, this is typical cocoa of super V. And this is typical type one super V. And these all the blue uh, black lines are uh, different kinds of pH stability supernova uh, light power prediction. So they can be bright for uh, uh, you know, much, much longer than typical super V we find and much, much brighter than uh, typical super V we found, find. So they can be searched uh, in the transient uh, survey data and see if we have a uh, uh, supernova looks like this. Um, this is a summary of predicted uh, properties of pH stability super V. So this is rise time. Uh, this is the peak magnitude in rest frame optical. And uh, type 2 super V, core crop super V uh, around here, and type 1 super V uh, around there. So they you know, rise in 10 or 20 days time scale. And then uh, there's two series of PN service supernova models. Uh, these are uh, red supergiant PN service supernova, which basically means uh, PN service supernova with hydrogen rich envelope. And uh, then this is uh, another series uh, with PN service supernova with, uh, uh, without hydrogen, so helium star PN service supernova. And this uh, number indicates the mass of each um, star. So in either case, uh, this rise time, as we saw in this you know, figure, rise time is much, much longer than uh, typical super V, more than 100 times, uh, more than 100 days rise time uh, expected. And uh, luminosity is uh, in the lowest mass range, it's comparable to a typical super V, but uh, if we go to higher mass, they become much more, much brighter than, uh, so the next question is, of course, if we have ever found this kind of pH stability super V and see uh, if we have consistent I know, the, um, result with what the evolution theory predicts. And uh, the most you know, discussed candidate for pH stability super V is so-called super luminous super V. And these are observationally known uh, super V, and uh, they are the most luminous super V currently known. And this black line is a kind of uh, one example of uh, super luminous supernova light curve. And uh, I, these are uh, type one super V and other core crop super V, as I showed before. And uh, you know, compared to other uh, Kind of super V, they are more than you know, 10 times brighter and they are also bright for a long time. So, when this, uh, when we started to recognize this super V, super v uh, there's a suggestion or discussion that they may be uh, a parent of super V, but uh, it has been like 15 or 20 years since the discovery of super V, super v and we have, we now have. Uh, many, uh, many hundreds of uh, uh, superluminous super we observed. Uh, so we have, we now know uh, typical properties of superluminous super we. And this is uh, one example. This is rise time of uh, summary of rise time and peak uh, G band magnitude of the of superluminous super V. So these are superluminous super V. Um, then these are typical uh, core of super V. And uh, as you can see, these rise time of uh, superluminous super V are typically larger than uh, core of super V. But still, typical rise time is less than 100 days. Uh, typically, it's like 50 days or so. And uh, if we Look at uh, uh, what's predicted for pH stability super V. The rise time is predicted to be typically more than 100 days. So they are uh, kind of uh, has the rise time is much shorter than what's predicted. Uh, although the luminosity is in a bright uh, range, so the rise time is uh, too short to be pH stability super V. And also uh, the spectral properties are also not consistent with what's predicted for the HIV super V. So this red uh, line is uh, one observed 
uh, superminus supernova uh, spectra. And then this blue line shows the uh, one uh, pair instability supernova predictions. And basically, if there's uh, uh, the pair instability supernova is gets bright because of the uh, 56 nickel production, and then that will decay to ions. Um, with this, uh, if there's a lot of iron, then because there's a lot of lines uh, of iron in the uh, blue optical range, basically most of the lines in blue bands will be uh, absorbed and then be emitted to the redder bands. So the NSIB supernova uh, spectral prediction tend to have a uh, very red spectra as we see in these blue lines, but uh, in this, uh, what's observed is typically rather blue, as in this uh, red lines. So it's kind of consistent with what's predicted for uh, pairing stability supernovae. So now we think uh, superminous supernovae are probably not uh, 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 pairing stability supernovae, and probably they are powered by different uh, source other than uh, nickel 56. Um, there's many course, discussion what's powering the uh, superminus supernovae, uh, but uh, I'm not going to uh, detail here now. Um, to my opinion, uh, probably the best pairing study supernova candidate we have so far is this OGU uh, object. And the explosion energy was sent to 52 Ls, and the estimated nickel mass was about one solar mass. And this is the light curve. And this nickel mass is estimated through the light curve modeling. And these two lines are uh, pairing stability supernova uh, light curve prediction. And this is for blue supergiant, and this is for red supergiant. Uh, anyway, this has a you know, you to be similar shape to uh, this. Uh, object and this was hydrogen rich and uh, yeah it may have been a blue supergiant pairing stability supernova but uh, unfortunately there's no spectra taken on the late phase so it's the light curve itself can be maybe powered by nickel but uh, we can't confirm the actual power source by observing the late phase so it still remains to be a uh, mystery so there's no confident pairing stability uh, currently uh, discovered. Of course, there's suggested several candidates, but uh, there's no conclusive one. So the question is why there's not much PNCV supernovae discovered so far, and how we can uh, discover PNCV supernovae. And this, these uh, uh, rates, rate PNCV supernova rate prediction as a red, as a function of redshift, and uh, this. Uh, people in Oakland uh, uh, got, took some uh, cosmological uh, simulations and they took uh, star formation rates and uh, uh, metallicity and so on from several uh, simulations and estimated by average supernova rate from them. And these four lines basically shows different prediction for pairing service supernova rate and these uh, these two dots are uh, observed uh, super uh, supernova rate. So, of course, now we have about 100 super uh, supernova observations. But uh, what's, you know, we currently the supernova survey has been done in optical uh, range, and that basically can cover the transients appearing in the local universe mostly. So in the local universe, because metallicity is relatively high, um, the pH stability supernova rate is expected, expected to be very low. And it gets higher uh, as the uh, star formation rate and the metallicity gets lower at higher redshift. So what's promising to discover pH stability supernovae is to do a transient survey in the, in the uh, you know, to probing this high redshift regime. So that means we need to have deep and wide supernova survey uh, reaching high redshift. Then you expect to have, you know, start the rate gets similar to superminous supernova rate. And then we can, we should be able to observe 
against the super V if we can prove uh, transients at high redshifts. So at first we did, uh, you know, to search for high redshift uh, supernovae, we conducted a uh, supernova survey using super telescope. And we have uh, a very wide field imager. So this is 8.2 meter telescope. So it's a big telescope. Uh, big. And then we also have a very wide field imager on the prime focus, which is called hyper spring cam. And uh, that has a field of, field of view of 1.5. Uh, 75 square degree. So this un entire Andromeda galaxy can be taken with just a single shot. And these are uh, the camera we had previously. So we basically improved previous camera and we now have this uh, hyper spring cam which can cover entire Andromeda galaxy in one shot. So this allow us this uh, imager hyperspin can allow us to have a deep and wide uh, transient survey, uh, although it's in optical, but we this can probe a uh, hybrid shift universe, uh, transients in hybrid, hybrid shift universe. So we did some transient survey to um, search for uh, hybrid shift supernovae, including uh, PNCV supernovae. So this is a kind of summary of a survey we did. So this, uh, this is the depth of a uh, transient survey and this is the area covered. Of course, we want you know, deeper and wider survey, but uh, you know, going wider takes time and going deeper also takes time. So uh, survey, transient survey is typically, you know, how, she needs to choose going deeper or going wider. Uh, so this shower, but wide, shallow wide survey like Assass Assassin and uh, ZTF and uh, so on. And uh, some very deep, but very narrow field uh, survey were conducted by uh, Hubble Space Telescope, but we did uh, kind of widest and uh, deepest uh, possible survey currently uh, we can conduct with hyper stream cam and with deep and ultra deep layer. And then of course, when LSST comes, this is very game changer and uh, we will see. Anyway, uh, I will explain what we did uh, with hyper stream cam. So basically we follow monitored uh, one field of view of uh, uh, hyper stream cam for uh, more than five seasons now. But now uh, in this paper, we summarized the uh, uh, data of five uh, past four seasons. So we have a very deep imaging, especially in red bands, uh, reaching to 26 uh, magnitude. And that uh, allows us to look for very uh, high redshift transients. And uh, we actually succeeded in getting a very high redshift supernova supernova which redshift of 2.4 and I believe this is now the second highest redshift supernova uh, known so far and this is the light curve and uh, it got bright and uh, yeah fainter in about like 20, 10 or 20 days and this is the pre explosion image and this is uh, uh, image with the supernova and this is the uh, subtracted image. So we have a uh, supernova in this galaxy. But uh, this, as you can see, this is in the rest frame. Uh, this, uh, this was very bright, but uh, evolving quite rapidly within 10 or 20 days. So it was not consistent with uh, what is predicted for PNCV supernova. And uh, we we found several high redshift supernova supernovae around redshift of two, but we couldn't find any uh, PNCV supernova candidates that should last for uh, for a long time. So through that, uh, through, through our survey, uh, the, by the fact that we couldn't find any PNCV supernova, we can get some constraints on the event rate of the PNCV supernovae. And uh, 
our survey uh, sensitive to up to actually a uh, redshift of uh, three-ish because thanks to this very deep survey. And uh, then we could put the upper limit for the parent survey supernova rate uh, from the fact that we didn't get any parent survey supernova. And that combined with this information, basically we could do out uh, this uh, uh, rate event rate region for parents that we supernova at high wave shift and that may already exclude you know some great prediction these two may be uh, already not consistent with current observation but anyway uh, you know, some are still consistent and uh, we should it's you know, we can it's good to go uh, even deeper uh, but uh, we are already you know um, the problem of hypersupreme curve is we are in optical range. So if we want to do more deeper and uh, probe, probe this uh, high shift supernova properly, we want to go to uh, near infrared to look for the uh, NCP supernova. So to move forward and to get really the uh, NCP supernova, uh, we need to do a deep and wide transient survey in near infrared. Unfortunately, uh, coming decade, uh, golden age of wide field near infrared astronomy. So in Europe, this Euclid uh, satellite uh, is planned, as I will explain. And then there will be Roman, which was previously called W first, uh, has a um, wide field image in near infrared again. And in Subaru as well, we have planned to um, develop a wide field near infrared imager that can be used for transient survey. And uh, so moving forward, uh, so Euclid is expected will be launched soon. Unfortunately, it's probably not going to be launched next year because they were planning to uh, use uh, uh, Soyuz uh, Russian rocket to launch the satellite, but now it's not possible. So they need to change the launcher. So it may be uh, 2024 at earliest, but anyway, it's, it should be the earliest uh, wide field uh, near infrared telescope uh, available. And uh, their Euclid mission, their main target is cosmology with weak lensing and galaxy clustering. So they plan to uh, observe very wide range, one 15,000, uh, square degree wide field. Basically, there's no cadence, and uh, there's also uh, 40 square degree deep fields. And actually, they don't plan to do any uh, supernova survey. Uh, it's just imaging survey. But uh, there's uh, they plan to have three deep fields uh, in north and south and in the Fornax region. And uh, this 40 square deg uh, degree deep field is uh, uh, regularly visited and this is uh, filters of Euclid so they have one uh, visual uh, wide field uh, fi filter and YJH filters are planned and uh, in this wide field actually uh, sorry in this 40 square deep field they actually keep observing the same field every uh, almost half year and this is uh, north, the current observational plan for the Euclid deep field north and south and Fornax. And this is the year after the start of the Euclid operation. And uh, then uh, they observe this deep field in this, uh, the time indicated by square. And this three means they will visit this, uh, this north field three times in this uh, time period. So this, for example, this Fornax field will be visited five times in this um, period. But anyway, what's important is that uh, they, uh, they will observe the same, port, uh, same field every about half year and uh, in 40, uh, square degree in total, and uh, each visit, visit will reach 25.5 magnitude uh, in this band, and uh, in near infrared it goes to 24 magnitude. And although this 
survey plan is not intended for uh, you know, transient survey. Uh, but uh, actually, as I explained, this PN survey supervisor has an extremely uh, long duration. And uh, also, thanks to the redshift, it can also be even longer. So if we plot uh, the PN survey supernova light bulb in Euclid H band uh, at the redshift of two and three, then uh, this is a uh, you know, predictive light bulb. And actually, they keep um, their brightness above 24 magnitude, which is uh, Euclid depth, for more than half a year. So even with current uh, observing plan uh, of this kind, uh, which is not you know, adjusted for uh, transient survey, we can use this data to look for parent survey supernovae and get some constraint on the parent survey supernova rate. And this is the peak magnitude in H band and with different um, parent survey supernova models. And in principle, brightest uh, parent survey supernova can you know, reach to about two, redshift four ish. So, yeah, we can probe the appearance of the supernovae with Euclid up to redshift of 3.5 ish with the current survey plan without any change in the plan. So, to estimate how many uh, appearance of the supernovae actually can be discovered with this current Euclid survey plan. We did some uh, survey simulations uh, for this Euclid mission, assuming the steps and this cadence. And of course, what we, we need to assume some uh, superluminous supernova rate. And for that, we took uh, the superluminous supernova rate. Basically, this rate is um, uh, extrapolation of superluminous supernova rate with a cosmic star formation uh, rate by Madawa and Dickinson. And then we also took about 10%, we took 10% of this uh, rate and then 1% of this rate. And this total line is the theoretical prediction I showed uh, before. And basically most of the prediction uh, rise between uh, 100 percent and 10 percent of the uh, superluminous supernova rate. So, you know, roughly speaking, we should expect, uh, you know, if the theory is correct, we expect to uh, have the numbers in between here. So, if we do this survey estimation with superluminous supernova rate, and this is cumulative uh, detection, uh, expected detection with the Euclid survey plan. Actually, if the pair instability supernova rate is as high as pair instability uh, uh, superluminous supernova rate, then we expect to have like hundreds of pair instability supernovae uh, detected from this Euclid survey plan. This is uh, basically because of the very wide field, 40 square degree uh, survey area Euclid can cover. And of course, uh, this going deep in near infrared also helps a lot. And then if we assume 10% superior supernova rate, then the number will just get 10%, but still it's like tens of superior supernova are expected to be discovered. And as I said, this theoretical prediction lies between 100% and 10%. So if these rates, rate predictions are really, PNSV supernova rate predictions are correct, then we should be detecting PNSV supernova uh, at least tens of parent survey supernovae through this Euclid survey, which is quite interesting and uh, I would say promising. And even if we don't get any parent survey supernova, that will give very strong constraint on the parent survey supernova rate in this redshift range. So if we don't get any parent survey supernovae, probably the parent survey supernova rate should be less than. Uh, 1% of uh, superior supernova rate, um, something like that. So that would be uh, quite interesting. And this Euclid will uh, tell us about the experience of supernova a lot, uh, although it's not designed for uh, supernova survey. So that's quite interesting and very uh, nice. And this is the redshift expected redshift distribution of the Euclid experience of uh, supernova.
So of course, uh, a question is how we um, identify these candidates. And as I said, so basically super we uh, expect it to be bright for a long time. So if the uh, supernova is detected for more than two epochs, that means for more than one year, then that's the fraction of uh, such supernova being potentially supernova is uh, large. So we can search for uh, uh, transients detected by Euclid that, that lasts for more than a year. And then we can follow spectroscopic for observation can be done. And of course, we can uh, we can also do color magnitude selection. So optical to H band uh, color and magnitude. Then the contamination could be high risk with type one A supernovae, and also type two supernovae. But uh, they don't become as bright as uh, the supernova in the optical. Uh, so in the infrared band. So we can search for uh, kind of optical uh, faint, uh, but uh, near infrared bright. Uh, supernovae that can be uh, uh, that's a good candidate for PNC study supernovae. And uh, with Roman, uh, so that's we have a kind of dedicated transient survey for uh, Roman because one of the uh, main goal of this Roman survey is type 1A supernova cosmology. So there's a two year time domain survey at least planned. And also there is some 20% of the time is uh, open for proposal. So we can you know, have flexible observation. But anyway, what's good about Roman is they have better filter than uh, Euclid. Euclid only reached to around two micron, but uh, Roman has even better one. So that means we can reach even higher redshift. So with uh, this filter, if we can, uh, you know, this, these uh, uh, right curve for potentiality supernova with these two red filters. And uh, if we can do supernova survey with 26 or 26.5 magnitudes, and then actually we can go beyond the redshift of six. So we can actually search for the uh, potentiality supernova at the epoch of reionization. So it's, you know, we can go really much farther away than uh, Euclid. So Euclid can go to the uh, Pensavi supernova in up to their shift is four-ish, and then we can go even farther away. And we can do um, color magnitude section as well to, to search for a uh, candidate as well. So this is, uh, you know, again, this contamination of type 1A supernova gets severe. Uh, which covers in this region. But if we do the survey with uh, this reddest filter combined with red three blue filter, then this red uh, dots uh, basically uh, what PI is a this is one of our prediction for color and magnitude. So we can distinguish this, uh, uh, this uh, type one supernovae from uh, and the PI is a supernovae uh, through color and magnitude. And then we can efficiently find candidates and then do the follow up observation by uh, JWST or 30 meter class telescope. Again, uh, we did some survey simulation with Roman, and uh, Roman can go, uh, you know, they can adjust survey parameter so we can do a deeper survey as well. And if we do uh, 10 square degree survey for five years, and assuming the answer is going to be. Uh, you know, following this uh, cosmic star formation history. And then we assume several cadence, but uh, just observing each one feet, 10 square degree every one year. So the, the, we are, because we are probing very high redshift, even one year cadence is enough to identify super redshift beyond six. So if we do one year cadence so observation, for five years for 10 square degree, actually we expect to discover like more than about 26, oh sorry, 20 parents say we super we are beyond six. So that would be really interesting. And we can get uh, information on the maybe first generation stars directory. And also we can uh, say something about uh, the ionization as well. 
Um, basically, that's it. So we PNCV suit on we are really fundamental prediction of the evolution theory, and uh, through the gravitational wave observations, we are starting to see the you know possible mass gap in the in the black hole mass distribution. But uh, there's still uncertainty in prediction, and we also start to see some black holes that may be in this black hole mass gap. Uh, predicted by the stereo evolution theory. But stereo evolution theory itself have uncertainty. Uh, it's good to have another, another way to uh, you know, test this pH stability supernova prediction, uh, which is directly observing this pH stability supernovae. Uh, we have searched for pH stability supernovae at high redshift with uh, Subaru telescope, but we couldn't find any yet. So that puts really a uh, kind of strong constraint, some constraints on the pH stability supernova rate up to redshift of three ish. And um, then to go further and um, to actually detect the uh, first PNC stability supernova, then Euclid is, uh, if the, the rate prediction from theory is correct, then Euclid will likely to discover PNC stability, maybe tens of them, if the prediction is correct, of course. But if we, even if we don't, then we have really some concern in the PNC stability rate. Then we can go even further with Roman and they can discover spiritual supernovae super be at the epoch of realization and we can directly see the properties of uh, first generation stars. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the very uh, deep uh, talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, first, maybe from the, the younger people. If there's none from the younger people, then Alex. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Does yep. it sound loud? Yep. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think it's, it, uh, I feel it's kind of an issue that you haven't seen these pairs stability yet. Is there, or is there any uh, tension between uh, the prediction of making the more massive Black holes, or even the black holes of the upper mass end of, of, of the distribution, and uh, not being able to find the pair instability. There should be maybe, maybe some transition, or, or if you uh, if you want to ever make these these very massive black holes that you have shown from stars that, that are uh, beyond three hundred solar masses, then you definitely should be able, should be making these stars in between as well to give you pair instability. Yeah, so to my understanding, currently the LIGO and VARGO are not so sensitive to these very high mass end of uh, uh, black hole mergers because of the frequencies and so on. So I think it's interesting to see what's up in the mass, yeah, to get this information above the mass gap, but uh, it's still not possible. Uh, at least we don't, I think it's, uh, not sensitive now. So yeah, that's quite interesting. And uh, see, I, I don't know if they can be adjusted to look for such high black hole mass range, but definitely those will be, uh, those information will be interesting. Okay. Thank, thanks. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Um, while people are thinking of uh, questions, I'm, I have one. Uh, so, based on the IMF, you uh, so I, I know the pen stability mass range is very uncertain, but um, based on the IMF, you you know you favor the lower mass stuff, and uh, I was wondering if you're going to see any pen stability supernovae, would you see more pulsational pen stabilities, and uh, like how yeah, many? May, are there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, could be more pulsational pair instability supernova than actual pair instability supernova. And I think there's more suggested candidates for pulsational pair instability supernova. Mm -hmm. um, these some you know, these uh, interacting some interacting supernova may be pulsational pair instability supernova. Mm -hmm. It's it's difficult to confirm again the if the origin of the, the interacting supernovae. But uh, yeah, with current, yeah, I think we have many good candidates for pulsational pair instability supernovae. That's 
kind of consistent with uh, yeah I don't know if anybody had proper rate prediction but uh, yeah there's at least more candidates than the answer this and so that uh, may be interesting and uh, so, so are you including those in the rate estimates for for your plane stabilities or is, is that's just like the genuine and stability stuff that you're looking for uh so if oops. yeah i was talking about the the pulsation of parent service supernova rate but the parent service supernova rate we you know it's like i say about 10 percent in the local universe it's 10 percent of a, a super luminous supernova rate and we mm -hmm. now that we have uh about 100 super luminous supernova then we may have detected uh one or a few uh in this if with this theoretical prediction and as i said there's uh one a few candidates we have for pi survey supernova that uh good ones but hasn't been confirmed mm -hmm. so i think that's kind of having a few good candidates with this super supernova rate and this prediction is uh, kind of consistent with this uh, rate prediction i would say okay okay um any other questions from the audience Uh, what's the cadence for the HSC? Uh, super HSC. Ah, uh, so yes. That... So that was. So we have many observations within half a year, but uh, yeah, basically we are busy every half a year ish. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so but it's not, you know, it's the schedule is not good for. <laughs> Transient survey actually. So we mm -hmm. just ask to observe some time in each time window. Um, but still, it's good for uh, long lasting transients like the uh, ICV supernova. So still, we can make strong constraint on the PNCVT supernova thanks to these uh, depths. So usual transient survey is like 20 hours. 20 magnitude, so it's extremely deep for that uh, typical transient survey. But it might, it might be hard to get the helium star. Uh, basically. Uh, yeah. Let's see, maybe I had the right I think helium star, yeah, could be, yeah, I think red super gems. Are uh, more easier because yeah they they tend to be longer but yeah both may oh, be okay it's still, yeah. Yeah, it's still eight hundred days okay um one last call for questions from the audience. If not, um, I think we've uh, reached the end of the hour. So um, let's thank uh, Takashi again. Thank you very much. I uh, hope to see you. Yes, we soon. very much hope, hope to see you <laughs> yeah, on Australian soil very soon. Yes. <laughs> okay, I then, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you.